Sorry about that. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Carol Westerberg, and I'm really excited to, to introduce the engineering resources team here at Sanford um, School of Earth. And I'll let you guys take it away. Um, um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Kara, for the introduction. And thank you to the Stanford Webcam Planning Committee for allowing us to share our experience with DEI and accessibility in digital spaces. Uh, my name is Larissa Roman, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm an admin associate with the Energy Resources Engineering Department, also known as ERE, in the School of Earth with Stanford University. You'll meet my colleagues, Cerise Burns and Emily Gwynn, later on in our presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just an overview of what we'll discuss today. It's going to be more of a case study for how our department approaches DEI and accessibility specifically for our websites. We we're in the middle of merging our research sites from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to reflect on how we can better serve our community and apply principles we have learned about DEI and accessibility. We're only discussing the tip of the iceberg as DEI and accessibility are more complex, nuanced topics, and there isn't an exact straightforward formula on how to practice it. So today we want to present to you some principles we follow to hopefully help you move forward in a more inclusive digital space for your community and providing a stepping stone towards your own research. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So what are DEI and accessibility? First, DEI stands for diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion. Um, you can easily do a Google search and find many different ways to define DEI and accessibility, but we wanted to focus on these specific definitions and you might see some overlap within the definitions. Uh, DEI is how we are all different. Or, or sorry, diversity is how we're all different or the same. Um, I identify as a woman, I identify as Asian American, I identify as Filipino, I identify as a Stanford employee. So these characteristics make me different in one way or another um, in a group. Equity, not to be confused with equality, aims to identify and eliminate barriers that prevent the full participation of some groups. Equality is treating everyone the same exact way no matter their circumstances. So equity is providing for groups to experience equal outcomes. If we all wanna cross the finish line at the exact same time, we're not all going to start at the same starting point. Some of us will have a different start location than others to ensure we make it to the end at the exact same time. So hopefully that clar clarifies the um, difference between e equity and equality. Inclusion is diversity in action. Diversity is a noun, inclusion is the verb. It's accepting and respecting the differences among people in a group. It's allowing people to feel a part of the group and how their ideas, experiences, and perspectives add greater value. And for this definition of accessibility, I really like it a lot. Um, it's the qualities that make an experience open to all. So we'll talk about so what we'll talk about today is how we can make websites open available for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then just so that we're clear on how we're defining digital spaces, a digital space is where information is accessed through a digital device or screen. So think websites, virtual meetings, email, social media, online videos, and other applications. Next slide. And why are all of this important? Um, these are just a few reasons why DEI and accessibility are important in digital spaces. Websites and digital spaces are important resources of information. So we wanna make sure we're providing this information in a way that is open to all. And within the past year, there's a much stronger online virtual presence. So it's even more important to ensure they are accessible and inclusive for your current and potential audiences. It just makes it easier for your users to access your content. The point of publishing content is so that others can access it. Um, not only do we want websites to be accessible, but it's important to keep DEI in mind to create a welcoming, inviting information spaces that provide value to their experience. For our community, ERE, we have a very international and diverse population, not only with our students, but along with our staff and faculty. So while we comb through our websites migrating to Drupal 8, it's important 
for us to keep DEI and accessibility in mind to reflect who we are as a community. And the topic of DEI is very present in current events. So it's not something that's going away or something that we can ignore. Like I said, we're focusing on approaching websites today, but more than ever, now is a prime time to self-reflect, especially as an organization and how we can be mindful and self-aware in all spaces and move forward with actions, no matter how big or small. And now I'd like to pass it on to Emily, who will start talking about the principles. Thank you, Larissa. My name is Emily. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm excited today to share best practices for DEI and accessibility in three areas, language, alternative text, and media. Next slide. Principles to remember. Put people first. Focus is on the person, not on their characteristics. Instead of a blind woman or a woman salesperson, use a woman who is blind or a woman on the sales team. We are more than our descriptors. Putting people first keeps the individual as the essential element and only include characteristics like gender, sexual orientation, religion, racial group, or ability when it's relevant to the content. Use universal phrases. Idioms, industry jargon, and acronyms can be exclusive of anyone who may not have specialized knowledge of a particular subject. Many idioms may not translate well. For example, the phrase hit it out of the park in reference to a home run in baseball or within an office setting in reference to someone doing something really well may not translate. And uh, using the phrase, I believe in you, uh, is a better way to get, get your message across. Recognizing the impact of mental and physical health language as well as racial and gendered language. Medical diagnoses like bipolar, PTSD, OCD, and ADD shouldn't be used to describe everyday behaviors. Also derogatory terms like gay, lame, insane, paranoid, psycho, crazy, ghetto should be avoided as well. Having a growth mindset. Individuals who believe their talents can be developed through hard work, good strategies, and input from others have a growth mindset. They tend to achieve more than those who believe their talents are innate and or a fixed mindset. When entire companies embrace a growth mindset, their employees report feeling far more empowered and committed. Ask if you aren't sure. Inclusive language is nuanced and used to reflect an individual's or group's personal style. If you're not sure, ask your colleagues and students how they refer to themselves. Next slide, please. In any digital or professional space, an accessible way to think about inclusivity is to consider the language we use. One of the most important ways to adopt and promote an exclusive and equitable philosophy is through understanding the words that we use. As we review this, the, uh, the list here, um, it would be interesting to see if anyone wants to type in chat any particular terms or phrases that you might know the history of or um, uh, might have an alternative, alternative to share. And you can get some ideas from this list here. Female, gals, girls, uh, easily becomes women or a uh, woman or women. Freshmen should be referred to as a first year student. Grandfathering or grandfather clause means uh, not, not subject to a change in the rules. The term grandfather clause originated in the American South in the 19, 1890s as a way to divide the 15th amendment and prevent black Americans from voting. A good alternative is legacy. Guys and ladies, Using guys to address all people is gendered language that may insinuate that men are the preferred gender. Instead, use gender neutral language such as folks, y'all, or teammates. Handicapped, handicap, handicapped. This term is believed to be rooted in a correlation between a person with a disability and a beggar who had to beg with a cap in their hand because of their inability to maintain employment. A better alternative, disability, or referring to things as being accessible, an accessible bathroom stall or an accessible parking space puts the emphasis on what someone can do versus what someone uh, what they cannot. Housekeeping, maintenance uh, or guidelines is a suggested alternative and housekeeping referring to the logistics around the office. Um, so you could say, we have guidelines to go over, we have um, some maintenance to take care of instead of housekeeping uh, to go over. Man, as in man hours, uh, is a synonym for work, um, manning the inbox, manning the conference booth. This is unnecessary gendered language and you, just using the word work instead is better. Master, 
uh, think master copy, master key, master house. This is a problematic term sometimes used to refer to one machine that has the original copy of data and others that automatically update themselves to match its data. Replacements for this word include primary, original, or expert. Okay, so we'll take a look at chat. Okay, I'm actually not familiar with that one. David, do you wanna jump in and, and talk about that one for a minute? Sure, um, dark patterns are, uh, in UX are usually patterns that are um, trying to be a little deceptive in trying to get you to do something that you may not want to do or not necessarily making it easy for you to do what you wanna do. Um, putting their organization's goals ahead of the user goals. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I think there was just a ruling on dark patterns recently about um, trying to get people to give up their personal information. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, so we were calling, we uh, had a conversation in the UXers uh, community practice and we decided to go with deceptive. Actually, we went with precipitous patterns first or precipitous, okay. but that was yeah. too hard for us to say, for me yeah. to say really. Um, and uh, so we went with deceptive. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And then using main instead of uh, master. Yep. Main original. There's tons, tons of of um, different words. Whitelist, approve list. Yeah. I saw. I've I've seen a lot. I saw a lot of those. I wanted to include, but we didn't want to, you know, venture too far out. Um, our resources to show a lot of um, a, a few links, a few articles that we found with um, a ton of different terms and phrases. Uh, all right, so the other, uh, let's see, I guess this was sort of another um, activity I wanted to, to try. We can, we can um, do it and then I can continue with the slides, but just coming up with two words that you find that you use frequently that could be replaced. So for example, uh, I use guys and crazy far too much. And so I'm working on changing my language there. Um, I refer I refer, refer to guys for people and objects. I'm noticing that with my son, I use guys for every single toy that he has. So I'd like to replace that with the actual toy itself. And the word crazy to refer to like specific situation or feeling. Um, uh, so yeah, words that you think you come up with uh, or you know that you use a lot and that can maybe change um, is a, a good way to start thinking about these things. Okay, next slide. Okay, so gender inclusivity, perfect. Uh, uh, this quote, I really liked it and I wanted to share with you. Uh, Rather than operating in a system where we assume each other's gender and automatically attach pronouns to each other, I'll instead let you know what pronouns work best for me. Also something to note is to avoid using the word preferred in front of pronouns because it implies that pronouns are optional. Saying my pronouns are or their pronouns are is a better way to say that. Uh, the next slide. This is a table showing the different binary and gender neutral, gender binary and gender neutral terms, uh, pronouns, she, her, hers, he, him, his, and three different variations of Z. Um, and also this is also an um, incomplete list of pronouns, but I wanted to give the example here. Uh, next slide will show examples of where to use pronouns across all of our digital spaces your website contact info, your email signature block, your Zoom profile, social media, virtual conferences like we are here in Zoom, professional profiles, LinkedIn, um, any surveys or forms, Slack, et cetera. Uh, the next slide will show more specifically with Zoom. Thanks. Uh, just that if you add it directly to your Zoom account, it will pop up on all of your Zoom meetings, but you do have to be logged in so making sure you're logged in to your Zoom account before you join any meeting will make sure your pronouns show up. And if uh, that happens to not be the case, you can you can add them to your Zoom window with the three dots in the upper right corner. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna jump into, oh, I did also wanna mention um, digital spaces, but also other professional spaces like business cards or name tags when we jump back into a hybrid uh, in-person meetings and such. Um, those are other things that we'll want to consider. Okay, I'll stop here and just look at chat.
Yep. Dude, crazy, having create. Yes, that sounds like my language. That's a good point, Robert. We'll we'll save that for uh, after discussion. I'll continue with my section here. Motion in media. Okay, so it's true that many of us want to use animations and parallax to increase engagement because we are all competing for attention in one way or another. Accessibility is broader than we might think and there are more ways to make your site accessible than uh, only screen reader compatibility. The accessibility of our website is often the most important part of site creation. Larissa uh, alluded to this earlier. If navigating a site to find specific information you want is a struggle, you will surely move on to the next site. So considering the following solutions to common problems with <clears throat> within motion and media. Uh, next slide, thank you. So some uh, common problems, motion parallax and animations on the web can actually make people feel nauseous, dizzy, or even give them a headache. And for someone with vestibular neuritis, the effect can be much worse and considered even painful. Uh, the definition of, of parallax, the apparent movement of objects when viewed from different positions and vestibular neuritis is an inner ear disorder that may cause a person to experience sudden severe vertigo, spinning, swaying, or sensation, dizziness, balance problems, nausea, and vomiting. Flashing content. Content that flashes at a particular rate or pattern can cause photosensitive reactions, including seizures, and flashing content is ideally avoided entirely uh, or only used in a way that does not cause known risks. Animations. It, animations and moving content can cause discomfort and physical reactions as well. Even predictive text, the input technology that facilitates typing by suggesting words the end user may wish to insert in a text field can be pro problematic. So some solutions here, um, unless essential to the content, um, providing mechanisms to switch off motion and animations will be really important. Also remember to let users play press play on videos instead of uh, having them play automatically upon entering the site. Provide a warning to users before flashing content is presented and also provide alternatives. Lastly, consider not using video backgrounds in Zoom or other meeting apps in order to be more inclusive of, of those with any vestibular or sensitivities to motion. Okay, next slide. Alternative text for media. It is, uh, Alternative text serves several functions. It is read by screen readers in place of images, allowing the content and function of the image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. It is displayed in place of the image in a in browser if the image file is not loaded or when the user has chosen not to view images. It provides a semant semantic meaning and description to images which can be read by engines or be used to later determine the content of the image from page context alone. The key principle is that computers and screen readers cannot analyze an image and determine what the image presents. So that is why it's important to apply accessibility uh, to, to media. So we have a uh, next slide, we'll have uh, some alt text best practices. Be succinct but thorough with content and function. You don't need to repeat anything that's already in the caption. Functional Im images need alt text in order to display what the purpose of the media is. And decorative images like an icon from Font Awesome, the popular icon site, should be coded and not used directly on a page. It's also best to avoid extravagant or opinionated language. Uh, an example would be using the word cute as a descriptor for an image of a puppy dog. It's best not to use images with text on the image, like a meme or images of a table or graph. Okay, so describing people. Identifying visual appearance is important only if it adds to the understanding of the content. Instincts for political correctness tend to inadvertently result in redacting information when we actually want to add more precise language to increase inclusivity. Physical features. When particular features are immediately noticeable or mutually agreed, agreed upon of a known person or visual, uh, of a known person are visually present, they should be described. This is not only in regards to prominent features or physical stature, but also physical disabilities. Identification. When describing an image of a recognizable person, identify them by name, but also describe their physical attributes. If an individual is not a public figure and the context does not imply the importance of who is represented, it may not be important, uh, appropriate to identify the individual. And avoiding terms that implicate judgment 
Um, this is where we can implement some of those inclusive language that we previously discussed. Uh, next slide. Gender in alt text. No assumptions should be made about the gender of a person represented. Although their gender is clearly, uh, excuse me, although where gender is clearly performed or verifiable, it should be described. When unknown, a person should be described using they, them, or person and their uh, physicality expressed through the descriptions of their features, which inadvertently tend to indicate masculine or feminine characteristics. The use of masculine or feminine are po problematic and should be avoided unless necessary for describing the performance of a gender. Uh, next slide, please. Ethnicity and skin tone. When describing the skin tone of a person, use non-ethnic terms such as light or dark complexioned when clearly visible. Because of its widespread use, the emoji terms for skin tone are recommended as shown here on the left. Also where skin tone is obvious, you can use more specific terms such as black or white or where known and verified ethnic identity can be included with the visual information. And so with that, up next, Cerise will show us an example of alt text, and then we'll move on into her section on design and layout, readability, and use of color. All right, thank you, Emily. I'm Cerise Burns, and I identify as she, her. And so I'd like to have everyone take a, about 30 seconds and just take a look at this image and think about what your alt text would be for this image. Feel free to type it in the chat if you want. Um, we'll just take a quick, quick 30 seconds. <laughs> And we'll give some examples that are not exact, but what we kind of came up with for these. Well, okay, good question, Kevin. That is kind of where we're going with this. So, um, all right, so looking at more non-specific context, uh, we might describe this picture as a person with light complexion and dark hair at a uh, desk with a laptop, smiling uh, while writing in a notebook and listening to headphones. A little, little extra detail there that you might not necessarily need, but that kind of gives a good description of the picture. But thinking about if this is more in a very specific context of an Asian and Asian American student study, a student group study page, uh, maybe somewhere on campus or something, you might describe it more as Asian American woman with light complexion and dark hair, I read over my computer, studying, smiling and listening to headphones. Um, and this you know, in the context, you obviously want to make sure that you can verify that she identifies as a woman too. So. <clears throat> yeah, so, all right. So definitely, obviously, everybody thought content right away. So content does matter. So, and yes, you could say earbuds. <laughs> obviously, I'm a headphone user, so I don't think about earbuds as much. So moving on to layout and design. Uh, layout and design are important for everyone to be able to understand your web page and have a good user experience on your page. So thinking about spacing and sections and your font use and color uses, um, as, as well as kind of making sure you're using that properly for accessibility. So very important always is having good readability on your page. Um, readability, is in kind of many forms here. So having good sections, like I said, on your web pages is a great way to provide better readability, uh, being able to identify information quickly, um, find it quickly on the page. If you don't find it quickly, uh, you might get frustrated and just walk away from that page, um, or rather not walk away, but click away from that page. Um, section, or sorry, in your sections, making sure your content is written for about a seventh to eighth grade reading level. Then also realizing that your audience might be very specific. So for our pages on ERE, they're very scientific. So they're going to be written very different way. If you're writing for medical pages or um, in, uh, like law school, you're probably going to have a little bit different content, but making sure it's still kind of accessible and understandable. Um, using bullet points and numbered lists, I combine them here. I wouldn't normally combine them a lot because it does look a little um, hard to read in, in the case of this page, but I just want to show you examples of those. But that will help identify information, give you succinct information quickly, um, and kind of be able to move around the page more comfortably. Using space to define sections, um, that makes it more um, readable. 
quicker to find the information, like I said before, but avoid this in text. You want to use left aligned text as much as possible and try to avoid using space inside your text as in like justifying text. That creates too much space for the eye to move around and it can jump around on the page and especially with people maybe with like dyslexia have a very hard time continuing to follow the text line. And then making sure that all these put together have a good flow and fit within your design. And um, I uh, didn't write this here, but also having a legible font, being consistent with your font choices and making sure it's not too decorative and um, fitting your, your context and making sure that it's uh, legible. So using headers, um, we, we at Stanford, we don't have, we have kind of specific way our web pages are. We don't get to adjust the back end of them very much, but we do have access to choose headers on our pages. But of course, on our titles, it kind of automatically puts in H1, so we don't get those anymore. So now we get H2 through H6, but with people with a little less experience on how the hierarchy of the headers work, might be tempted to use headers based on the look and size rather than placing them properly for the hierarchy of the page. Um, using bold and italics for emphasis is awesome, but not in headers. So kind of avoiding uh, making that for a design thing in headers. Those, those sorts of things should be taken care of in the CSS rather than using uh, the content editing parts for that. All right, moving on to color in our uh, design and layout. So using color can create a, a lot of, like your, for your branding can create a lot of um, nice things on your page. However, you have to be conscious of how you're using them. And I will be going into a little more in depth on things like charts and diagrams, as we experience this a lot in our department. And I was creating a bunch last week and realized that my colors were very difficult um, for perhaps people with visual uh, issues to see those colors properly. So you, uh, worldwide, the percentage of people with color vision deficiency or CVD, about 8% of men have color vision deficiency and about 0.5% of women have color deficiency. So this doesn't seem like a lot, but it's enough that obviously we'll, we wanna make sure that we have this accessible. So here are some examples of how people with color division deficiency might be seeing colors. We're using true here as a basis. Uh, this is not truly how everyone sees. If you think about your computer screens are showing different colors all the time. Uh, my computer screen on this side does not have the same colors on this side. So it will look different to everyone. Um, there are a few different types of color deficiency. Uh, red green color deficiencies include proteinopia, deuteranopia, proteinomaly, and deuteranomaly. So you can see up here on the right corner and down here in the middle. And then there are also blue yellow color deficiencies, tritinopia and tritinomaly. And then there are also um, what you might be able to call uh, color blindness because there aren't colors in here, monochromacy and monochromatic. So we don't really use the word color blind because as you can see, there are still colors coming through. It's just a um, issues with uh, cones in your eyes, not being able to see certain color uh, wavelengths. So here are some examples of using these colors for charts. I use Google uh, Sheets and, and Slides to make all these ones here. And I realized that Google's theme colors aren't necessarily super accessible. They also don't offer other options beyond color to make them more accessible. So it was a nice way to see where I was kind of needing to pay more attention to the accessibility colors here. So here's an example of how this true basis kind of the theme colors you pick from Google would translate over to protonopia, deuteranopia, and tritonopia. So right here is a very obvious area where the colors look very, very, very close, similar together. And you can see a lot of these colors do look similar to each other. So think about the placement of where those colors are, not just um, what colors you're using, but you can see like some of these greens and kind of yellowy tones here would sort of potentially blend in together. So we wanna be conscious about where we're using that. So here's a bit better of a color chart for um, CVD. I got this from David Math Logic. 
and it has some examples. It will pull up the different kind of color tones you're going to see here. You can add in colors, uh, change the colors, replace the colors. You can't move them around, so you don't necessarily get to see how colors look next to each other, but I'll share another tool I use for that. So this is a decent pick. However, you can still see these colors are a little bit close together, so that may not be the best option. So looking at uh, better practices for thinking about your colors in your page and in your um, perhaps content charts, things like that. You want to use high contrast as much as possible. This allows the eye to pick up the difference in the color. And this is good for everyone, not just people with color vision deficiencies, and is a great practice all around. Using monochrome palettes is a great idea because this is accessible by pretty much everyone. And I'll show you uh, what that looks like in just a minute in other ways. And then keeping with that a sensible flow with your colors as well and not having it get too um, all over the place with colors because that can be kind of hard to follow. So let me share. This is a page called Coolers. And this one's really great because you can create different color palettes. This is the color palette I used on that pie chart. And looking at this, I can move the colors around to see where they will uh, go next to each other if I want to. And then I can also check, uh, they use the word color blindness, but check for color deficiency palettes. So I can go through all of these, looking at what they're going to look like and adjusting as needed and figure out where you know, colors may not be working well next to each other or if the palettes don't work. But as you can see, the monochrome palettes are really nice because you get um, colors that are fairly discernible to each other. But what happens if you want to get past color on that? So uh, take just a minute if you want to type it in the chat. What are other options you can use besides color to show maybe like in a chart um, the different sections, maybe a pie chart? Okay, I already see one. Yeah, so patterns is a great one. Any other ideas? So yeah, labels is great, outlines, yes. And I tried doing some kind of pulling pieces of the pies apart, but it was creating weird, weird spacing. It wasn't providing enough spacing um, to show the difference. So another option is using icons. So just like labels, yes, we have these labels. Putting them inside might be helpful. Um, using icons can be helpful. However, if you start looking at these smaller pieces, I can't put in icons in there. But icons can be nice to do kind of quick identification to greater understanding, um, accessibility for all ages, all um, education levels, all um, kind of ranges of where people are. So using universal icons is best, obviously, as Emily mentioned with your content, um, your jargon content, you don't want to use an icon that's not accessible, that's super specific. <clears throat> okay. Oops. There we go. So texture um, patterns, those are a great way to show difference. You can see though on this pie chart, it's a little bit small, especially if you're on a smaller screen. So paying attention to where how your pattern looks as well and how it looks with the colors. Is it going to work with the colors well? Like if you look at this bar with dog, maybe a yellow might not come across because there's too much white space with the yellow. So the contrast isn't great. And then also combining the icons, labels, um, for quick identification for people and being able to see the spacing in here, but it, that might not provide on. So paying attention to all those pieces there. And then as you can see here, these ones are stand out a lot more than they do in the pie chart. So, all right. So that brings us about to the end here. So this is uh, you know, the end of our talk, but this is not the end of our journey. These are just things that we've started discovering and paying more attention. Uh, closer attention to while migrating our sites and doing other um, projects for our pages. So we hope that you all also keep uh, looking into some of these um, areas and think about more of the DEI aspects that is kind of coming up in the world today that's very important. And we have uh, resources and citations for all these, so we'll be happy to share our slides if you're interested. So if anyone has any questions or the discussion? Thank you. That was lovely. Uh, very interesting on the colors. I was going to say, if you want to put your slides or your um, resources up on the website, you can either pass them to me or or, or I, 
not sure if, or some one of the web camp people and they will um, put it on the site for you. All right. I noticed a little discussion on the the length of the alt text, and um, I was going to comment that I believe that when the screen reader goes to read alt text, it can't pause in the middle and come back, and that's why you want to keep it short. Is that something other people have heard? Yes, I um, definitely checked I, the second alt text piece. I did not check the first one last minute, so I. I know I probably have a little too much descriptor on there, so I'd probably shorten it down a bit. Um, I believe the second one was under 125 characters, but I uh, to check on that. So yeah, definitely using, I used Word to check that. Unfortunately, Google, doesn't, I haven't found a word count on there. If someone knows where to find that, please let me know. Um, yeah, and also writing in simpler language helps with automatic translation. Um, definitely, we we don't necessarily have that option on some of our pages because, like I said, a lot of them are we have um, affiliate group pages where we have extremely specific content. So it's kind of audience geared, but it is nice to be able to have something even readily available in those in those cases as well. And Sharon mentioned here about the term handicapped, that it driving from uh, sports rather than um, from someone begging. So I will review those notes and, and revise what I had because, yeah, the correct information is always going to be the right way to go. Thank you, Sharon. Although that link didn't come up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the OED. You can go if you have Stanford access. Um, you can go to um, SearchWorks and search for OED, and there's a, a link to to you have access to the OED, um, and you can just search for the word handicap. Okay. Um, I was hoping that if you had Stanford access, you could go to the link and it would make you log in and it would let you see it, but apparently not. I tried. <laughs> you might have to be VPN for that to work because- uh, Oh, it should be. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have VPN set up for that. In, um, oh, you mean for the link to work? Yeah, okay, yeah. I see what you're saying. I'm slow. <laughs> Although I'm on VPN and it still didn't work, so. I yeah, I just I just go to um, yeah. um I just go to the uh, to search works, look for the OED and and search for the word you're you know go there and make you log in. Sorry for okay. the people who are not Stanford. <laughs> True. Yeah, we we definitely get a nice advantage having that being able to search everything and anything online here with all that. Yeah, and if there is any more discussion about pronouns, um, I definitely don't consider myself an expert. So if someone wants to jump in, that is welcome. I did see um, in doing some, some of our other DEI things about not requiring pronouns, uh, you definitely don't have to require them, don't force them on people. So the whole reason of, of having them is so that you can create more of an open space for people to feel comfortable to do that um, and not just, you know, you don't have to tell people like, please put your pronouns or this or that. Just doing, just having them there shows people that you're um, aware of that and that people are able to feel comfortable to come to you if they, if they want to or to put it on their thing. So it's kind of showing that, I guess, mm, being more tempted to not use this word, but being more kind of an ally to people um, without forcing it. 
I have a question, a related question. Have you done any, uh, do you have any opinions on the, um, the more recent trend of land acknowledgement? Not heard of that actually. I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, but that brings up a good point that like we were, we were um, kind of touching only the iceberg on a lot of these subjects and there's so, so much broader. So that's a good point to bring up if we wanna revise this presentation, we can look into some more aspects that we didn't cover. Um, Robert says that they're using that in the art. So if you would like to chime in, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, for Stanford Earth, um, we've been, the communications team has been partnering with, um, the university's office that uh, was trying to put out that new land acknowledgement. And so we do have now on our DEI site, uh, a land acknowledgement page that um, goes into some of that. So, um, and so we're, we're currently trying to make sure that um, in earth in general, if people wanna have some kind of land acknowledgement because it is, it has come up several times. And so they can have um, something on their website and point to the main page that um, we we're using that we that the university is basically using as well. So that's great. I was I was at a loss if I were to, have to say something. What would I be saying? I'm glad somebody did oh, the yeah. research. Um, you have that link that site handy, Claire? Yeah, let me go find it. So put that in chat and this is the uh, Stanford Earth land acknowledgement page and then it links off to the university page as well, so. Thanks to everyone for sharing all of these resources. It's a learning experience for, for everyone, for us too. Yeah, thank you everyone. This is great. It'd be neat to have like a succinct style guide we could just refer to. So when, it, so if you ah, come up with something idea. like that, that would be fun to have. We should create that document. Did, didn't UCOM just put up one? Is anybody from you come here? Is that on the new identity site? Is it there? I'm not sure. I think it's I'll still find in out. draft. I'll find out from Dana. I think it's like in draft review, but it's coming. Thanks, Alexis. There was a um, an identity she went over yesterday. She went. Um, she did an overview of the new site for um, identity at Stanford at EDU and. I was so busy monitoring things, I didn't get to <laughs> listen to everything. So I'm going to look at the video, but that might be a good, um, good one to watch when we post the video later. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Might end the session, let everybody get a, a break before the next session. Thank Thanks, you so thank much. You. Can everybody un unmute and give a clap? <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you all for okay. joining. Have a nice day. Okay, uh, I'm going to hop off now. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> thank Bye. you, Carol. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks.